Let me say good morning to our participants. In a few minutes, we are going to start our special lecture. Professor Mandel, Mr. Moravez, distinguished guests, University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce administrators, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the special lecture on remaking the international exchange rate system, the optimum currency area approach to a global currency. This is part of the event series of Bridges Dialogue towards a culture of peace held in Philippines and Thailand from November 2007 to April 2008. In a few minutes, we will start the welcome remark with Assistant Professor Dr. Sawani Tayurung Ron, the Vice President for Research. May I call for Assistant Professor Dr. Sawani Tayurung Ron to give a welcome remark. Professor Mandel, Mr. Morawe, UTC Administrator, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce, may I welcome all of you to a special lecture co-organized by the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce and the International Peace Foundation. This special lecture is held to commemorate the 45th anniversary of the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce and to cooperate with the International Peace Foundation in building up a culture of peace which can only be achieved to broad international cooperation among education institutions themselves by creating alliance and partnerships with a broad range of institu institutions, organizations, educationalists, and researchers, as well as with civil society at large. The International Peace Foundation is well known in Thailand for its variety of peace activities, ranging from lectures, workshops, seminars, artistic events, conferences, and programs. This special lecture on remaking the international exchange rate system, the optimum currency area approach to a global currency, will eventually provide a forum for interested participants to exchange ideas and cooperation regarding the issues on exchange rate systems and global currency. 
Our special guest speaker, Professor Robert A. Mandel, is a Nobel laureate in economics for his analysis of monetary and fiscal policy under different action rate regimes and his analysis of optimum currency areas. He is known as the father of the theory of optimum currency and has made great contributions to a number of international agencies and organizations, including the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the European Commission, and so on. I am confident that all the participants will get great benefit and pleasure from his lecture. The other guest of honor is Mr. Uwe Molores, the founding chairman of the International Peace Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, this history lecture may be short, but it surely will be a memorable one for all of us. And I wish you enjoy the talk and have a good time while you are with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Assistant Professor Dr. Sawani Tairuburo, for your warm um, welcome. Okay, at uh, this auspicious moment, I would like to ask Mr. Uwe Moravez, Chairman of the Board of Directors International Peace Foundation, to deliver his opening address. facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political and non-religious foundation, under the common patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with uh, local partners, including some of the country's major universities. Starting this November, bridges will be continuously held in Thailand and the Philippines, until April 2008, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. The first ASEAN-wide series of bridges is an independent contribution to the decade for a culture of peace and nonviolence, which was initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. It follows a series of 250 events, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand, from November 2003 until April 2005. 26 Nobel laureates, as well as 12 other keynote speakers and artists, such as Dr. Hans Flix, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, Vanessa May, and Jesse Norman participated in these events. They were presided over by Her Majesty Queen Sirikit and Her Royal Highness Crown Princess Maha Chakri Sirinthorn, or Somdet Patel, and reached an audience of 70,000 participants. As peace cannot be achieved instantly, but is a process which needs time, Bridges has not been organized as a single event, but as an ongoing series in which Nobel laureates, world-known artists, and international decision makers have built strong bridges with Thai leaders in all parts of society and with the general public. With the basis for peace being education, and synergies being the fruit of cooperation. The International Peace Foundation hasn't realized bridges alone, but has carried out the program together with UNESCO and 75 other national and international institutions, including 23 major universities and schools. The multidisciplinary and pluralistic approach of bridges reflects that peace involves all parts of society. It involves awareness and social responsibility of politicians, the business community, scientists, artists, and the media. And since peace within ourselves, our families, and environment starts in our minds and hearts, it involves every one of us. 
In this sense, bridges challenges us to cross borders and to build bridges by listening and opening up to other viewpoints, by generating new thoughts, and by developing innovative forms of cooperation, and by fulfilling the desire of everyone to get to know and to learn from each other. This can lead us to a world in which we will be able to understand each other and the complexities we face today in a new light. The globalized world needs broad strategies for change to secure a sustainable future for us and the next generations. Let us be inspired by the knowledge and the wisdom that Bridges continues to offer. An opportunity to get a more inclusive, interconnected and comprehensive view of ourselves and the world in which we live in and which we are able to create anew constantly through dialogues towards a culture of peace which needs the participation of everyone. I thank our host today, the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce, and its president, Dr. Chirade Osuwat, and our keynote speaker, Professor Robert Alexander Mondel, the 1999 Nobel Laureate for Economics. He has come to Thailand without any honorarium to support the events, and we now look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. A warm welcome, Professor Mandel. for your patched uh, address. Let me start. Well, it's time for the highlight of the event. Today, I have the singular honor and privilege of introducing our keynote speaker, who has been professor of economics at Columbia University in New York for the past 23 years. He has been renowned in the profession for his brilliance. He picked up his PhD in six months residency at MIT. From his professionalism in economics, not only has he lectured widely in North and South America, but also in Europe, Africa, Australia, and Asia. He has also been an advisor to a great number of international agencies and organizations. Just to name some, the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, the Government of Canada, and many, many more. In addition, he has been the authors of numerous works and articles on economic theory of currency areas. He formulated a standard international macroeconomics model, and he was a pioneer of the theory of the monetary and fiscal policy mix. His publications include the International Monetary System, Conflict and Reform, Men and Economics, Monetary Theory Interest. Six volumes of his collected work were also published in Chinese in 2004. And on October 13, 1999, he received the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics from the Royal Swedish Academy of Science, and he has become a Nobel Laureate for economics since then. The topic of his special speech today will be on remaking the international exchange rate system, the optimal currency area approach to a global currency. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Robert Alexander Mandel. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and to uh, talk to you. I think it's this unique institution, the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, University. Uh, this subject uh, that I'm talking on, I'll have some slides like this. Uh, I'm uh, reading the newspaper, something about uh, 
this headline reporting some of my remarks the other day. Fixed currency system outdated. Now, if that were the case, you'd have to throw out all of economics because uh, you could never have, uh, if you didn't have any kind of fixed relationship between units of expenditure and money, uh, you could never have the law of one price. You'd never have a market. you never have a coherent market. So you, you have to, uh, and we have to go into that a little bit, some of the theory of it, and we'll get into it. Uh, uh, we'll, um, I'll look at some of these uh, issues first. Some, rough history of the international monetary system um, uh, throughout the last 2,500 years of history, the international monetary system, there has been one. It's based on some kind of common currency or some kind of standard that, that can be used as a kind of universal currency. Uh, back in the uh, when, the days when we think that maybe coinage was invented in ancient Lydia, this is one, one theory of when it was invented, about the 8th century BC, then countries began to use coinage. The coinage was overvalued and used it by nation states. And then in the great empires, they all created a common currency because of the great economies of scale associated with the use of one currency or one unit of expenditure instead of that many. Imagine, imagine a world of barter where there's no money and then you have uh, 10 different commodities or 20 or 100 different commodities. Imagine how complicated it would be to think in terms of, of uh, exchange relationships without a common unit of account. And actually in the same way, if you had, if you have, how many monies should you have if we had it? System. How many monies would it be good for, let's say, a country of uh, 70 million people? Really, like the whole world 3,000 years ago. How many, how many monies should a country of 70 million people, 65 million people like Thailand have? Would it be better to have one money, or 10 monies, or 100 money, or 1,000 or a million money? One for each person. What's the, what's the unit? Uh, how many how many currencies should Thailand have? Now, if Thailand had many currencies, if you had you'd have to have um, many issuers of the currencies, many central banks in Thailand. You could have every province could have a separate currency, and then the question would be: If every province had a separate currency, uh, what would be the exchange rate between one currency and the other? Should they always be fl flexible? Would you want to have 70 currencies in Thailand all flexible to one another? Or would it be better to have uh, uh, the currencies all fixed so that uh, a common unit was, was exist? That's really what the issue is. Another way of looking at it is think for a moment about the European Union. The European Union has 27 members now. Uh, and uh, it's got the European Monetary Union has 13 members. Now, recent, the most recent member added to it was uh, was uh, uh, Slovenia, uh, a very very tiny tiny country. Now, the 13 members of the European Monetary Union include big economies like Germany. Germany is the fourth largest country in the world now. China took over Germany's places. Is, uh, is, is number three in this. Uh, Germany, uh, France, and Italy, all countries with uh, GDPs in over over two uh, trillion dollars a year. So they're a very large economy, but they're all using the same money. They gave up their currencies. They gave up first. They had fixed exchange rates, and uh, that was better than flexible rates between the European Union countries. And then they moved to to uh, uh, the common currency. They gave up exchange rates. They got the, a common currency is the apotheosis of fixed exchange rates. So we better be careful when we look at headlines like this, fixed currency system outdated. Because if you do, you have to give up everything. There's no, uh, there's no, imagine this world, imagine the world was all the people in this room. And uh, they had, um, 
and no money. They would start off with, uh, let's say there are 10 products that could be traded. What would happen? People would go around, they'd mingle, they'd make bargains with one. It would be very complicated, but gradually they'd settle on some kind of prices. But there wouldn't be, it would be a very inefficient way of, uh, of establishing a price system. The price system start usually because there's a market develops. A market develops when, uh, when uh, people look at two price ratios and then they, uh, they always bid. And they bid until they get everything for the cheapest price and they sell things for the most price. Everybody wants to get the most and they want to pay for things with the least. And if there are price differences, arbitrageurs can always trade back and forth, and then those price differences get uh, get eliminated. So if you had one money in this room with ten commodities, you'd uh, be able to have you'd have ten prices of each of those commodities would eventually be established. That's not too bad. But suppose you had two currencies in the room, three, four, or five currencies in the room units of account, it would quickly get hundreds of prices. In the world today, uh, there are members of the International Monetary Fund, about 185 members, 185 members of the International Monetary Fund. <coughs> now, some of those members don't have a currency. Uh, San Marino doesn't have a currency. San Marino is a little country, a little principality of a 10,000 people in uh, 15,000 people in uh, Italy, they don't have a currency. They use the euro. They don't have a currency. And if, there are a few countries like that. Andorra doesn't have a currency. In some other places like that. Now, uh, uh, Germany doesn't have a currency of its own. Germany shares that with never. So there are maybe all together represented in the IMF something like 170 currencies, even though there are 185 members. 170 currencies. In. But suppose, let's take the, an even number, let's say there are 200, 200 currencies. In a world of 200 currencies, how many exchange rates are there? Well, there's a formula for it. It's a half times n times n minus 1, where n is the number of, uh, of currencies. So a half times n, half times 200 times 199 is 19,900 currencies. You have an exchange rate. 19,900 currencies. You can do that. You can calculate that. If you take look at one of the um, um, uh, the, the grids on, on the, in the newspapers about exchange rates, and you see cross rates, well, you only have to count half the rate because half of them are, are given up, and then you use one unit of account, and you get, if you have 200 currency, if you have a grid of 200 this way and 200 this way, uh, you get half times n times, you get 19,900 currency, almost 20,000 currency. Well, supposing we had 10 products to exchange, how many prices would there be? If you had one currency, there'd be 10 products. But if you've got 200 currencies, there'd be 20,000 times 10 products. So it's the efficiency element is, you, if you don't have, of course, you may want to have 200 currencies, but if you had them, you could it would be you could economize on the information and transactions cost of it by fixing the price of all the currencies so that they act like one currency. That's what countries did historically, back starting in Lydia or before, and who knows that India and China may even much before this. They started with uh, a coinage, and that coinage was the coinage was typically based on a, on a metal, on, a, on a, common, a common product that was widely used, and that most widely used product was uh, turned out to be the most efficient, uh, were the precious metals, gold, silver, and copper. You have, uh, you need, uh, uh, they serve, gold, silver, and copper serve different things. Uh, it's hard to find, if you took the amount of gold that it would take to buy a cup of coffee, it would be so small you wouldn't be able to use it. You wouldn't be able to transact anything with it because it would be a little piece of dust, powder dust of gold. You 
couldn't use it. So it wouldn't do for small transactions. You need even silver wouldn't be very good for it. You need need uh, the copper transactions for that. You need middle-sized transactions. Silver for long-term transactions. You need uh, gold. Gold is the one. Gold was the one most used by the richest countries and by for in long-distance international trade because it's the cheapest to travel. Per unit of value, it's the most valuable, and it, so it uh, was uh, the cheapest to use for international trade. Of course, now we don't have to worry about gold and silver because, because we don't um, uh, we don't use those uh, those products. Uh, <coughs> well, that's that's sort of the basic idea. But then, so uh, under the uh, for a long time we had trimetallic trimetallic. Gold, the price of gold and the price of silver and the price of copper were fixed relative to one another. Throughout the 19th century, up until 1873, there was the bimetallic system. The price of gold and silver was fixed. Because as long as one country fixed both gold and silver, and it was a big country, and it was a significant country, then that would be the fixed price that would reign in the world economy. In the uh, uh, Napoleon set, uh, France onto the uh, bimetallic standard in 1803. France was a big country then. Now, earlier, 1792, Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of the Treasury in the United States, set the United States on the bimetallic standard. It fixed the price of gold and the price of silver, two par values. The gold was uh, 15 times more valuable than silver, so the bimetallic ratio was 15 to 1. And then Napoleon, after the French had, after the French Revolution had a big inflation paper, used paper currency, and Napoleon set uh, uh, France back onto a bi bimetallic standard. He chose the same ratio for gold and silver that uh, had been Louis, uh, Louis the Sixteenth, uh, the Colon ratio was called it, fifteen and a half to one. So anyway, you had fifteen and a half to one in in France, and then. Uh, and France was a big country, a big economy. The United States was a little economy then, back then. Of course, over the 19th century, the U.S. got bigger and bigger, and eventually the U.S. economy became bigger than the French economy. And it became bigger than any other economy in, the, in, that, in, that, in that century. But the idea of fixing, some fixing by mechanism was that it let countries all over the world achieve a kind of monetary unity. So it didn't matter. A lot of countries over the world could use the silver standard. And other countries like Britain could use the gold standard. But it wouldn't matter because they have a common denominator of, of uh, the fixed price of gold and silver. And the exchange rate is about 15 and a half uh, silver to uh, units of silver to one unit of gold. So we had fixed exchange rates all through the world of all those countries that were either using gold or silver. Now then, in the 1870s, for reasons that are a little complicated, uh, the bimetallic standard broke down. It broke down because, well, in, let's say in 1860, two countries were on bimetallism. Now two pretty big countries, France and the United States. The United States by 1860, it's become a big country. Those two countries established in, with a bulwark that kept maintained the bimetallic standard, and that was you had that gave that unit to. Well, then, two years later, the United States. A year later, the Civil War in the United States broke up, and the United States went off specie standard. It didn't have any gold or silver. So, France left the bimetallic. And then, in 1870, there was a war between France and Germany. And then France left by medicine. So then no country was on by medicine anymore. That meant that the price of gold and silver would move. And there's a different dissension in the world between the gold block and the silver block. And then uh, gradually, the, um, Germany went under the gold standard. Uh, Scandinavia, in Italy, uh, uh, went under the gold standard. And then the United States went back to gold about 1879. And then all the world was moving toward the gold standard, and they moved off the silver standard. The developing countries were more on the silver standard. And, but because the 
big countries were going under the gold standard, going off silver, as Germany had been on the silver standard, they dumped silver. The price of silver went down, and the uh, price of gold was going up. Everybody was buying gold. So gold, all the countries that went under the gold, had a little bit of deflation, because gold was becoming more valuable. And the countries that were in silver had a bit of inflation. So there's a big difference between the whole, in the 19th century, the gold countries and the silver countries. The gold countries had a period, a whole decade of, of uh, deflation. Or no, not decades, three decades of deflation from 1873 to 1896. And then the other countries on the silver standard, which include now China and uh, India at this time, India later went on the gold, uh, were on, 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 the, uh, on the silver, had, had a better, better system of, uh, of price. But anyway, the dominant block in the world uh, moved to gold, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, by 1914, all the major countries were on gold. The two exceptions would, fairly big exceptions, would be uh, 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 China, which was on the silver standard, and uh, Mexico. Mexico was a big producer of silver. And all this, like, so, so that was the way the world was in 19, 1914. Well, um, but, but notice here the hunger, the need, the, the desirability of keeping fixed exchange rates even between the gold and the silver block countries. This, this is the important thing because, because if you have a, a, common, a common currency in, in the Bimetallism was a little bit like a common currency. This uh, would um, uh, uh, this gave a monetary unity because it meant that wherever you go, you can establish one system of prices throughout the world, and that's the most efficient thing. Uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, the great philosopher and economist, writing in 1848, says, "So much of barbarism still exists." in the transactions of nations, that uh, nations choose to assert their own individuality to their own inconvenience and that of their nations by having a separate currency, their own. 19, 150 years ago, we thought in terms of a, a global currency. And that this, well, th this is, I left out, this is, this table enters at the time of the breakup of the bimetallic system. How, how did I choose that 1873 date? I looked at the price of gold in terms of silver in London. And all the time, from 1815 to 1873, the relative price of gold and silver didn't move outside the range of 15 to 1 and 16 to 1. That's about a 6% variation in the price, all through up from 1815 to 1870. But then in 1873, uh, a lot of things were happening. The silver was discovered in Nevada, and, and Germany was dumping, and Scandinavian countries were dumping silver on the world market. And so the price value of gold, and the, the, so the bimetallism ended in 1873. Uh, how, how many of you have heard the, um, uh, have ever seen a movie uh, called The Wizard of Oz? How many have heard of that movie? <clears throat> That's about the gold standard. The Oz is the ounce of gold. The Yellow Brick Road is the gold standard. And the wizard at that time was President uh, Cleveland, the model, you see, to satire on, on, the, uh, on the gold standard. And because there's great dissension in the 19th century in the United States because the gold standard was creating deflation. Prices were going down for three decades in the United States, and the Americans didn't like it. Of course, not, not Americans were on a flexible exchange rate in the 1970s, 1870s. They called it the greenback standard, but they didn't like it. And they, wanted, they went back to the gold standard, but the gold standard was causing deflation. And deflation always hurts debtors, debtors. And it's, so the, uh, and it's a benefit to creditors. So a fight between creditors and debtors is, in the uh, period, period, period. But then in 1896, 86, this turned around and prices in terms of gold started to rise. 
because 1885 was the great discovery of gold in South Africa. And South Africa that came on, to the, started coming onto the world market, and even though Russia and, uh, and Austria Hungary were going on to the gold standard, and Japan was going on to the gold standard, creating more demand for gold, the increasing supply was enough to overcome that and, and gradually move to an inflationary period. Because of, uh, when the tremendous production of gold from South Africa uh, was able to dominate the, uh, the, the uh, system. You know, most of the gold in the, today, in the world as a whole, there's about 5 billion ounces of gold above the ground. It's been dug out of months. 1 billion ounces of that uh, is in the central bank. In the hands of the central bank. Maybe, uh, so another way of thinking of it is, if you want to think of it in tons, about um, a total stock of gold above ground is about maybe 160,000 tons. But one billion ounces of gold is the um, amount that is in central bank stocks today. They still, we're not on a gold standard, but central banks all over the world still have about 900 million or 950 million ounces of gold. Now, of course, price, price has just gone up over uh, yesterday, it was, or the day before, Friday, it was over eight hundred dollars an ounce. And this morning or last night it was seven hundred and ninety, so it's gone it went down a little bit. But it, it, gold is a very high price of that. So that's the stock of gold. That was used as money and when countries run the gold standard, currencies were named for different weights of gold. British currency, the most important currency of the 19th century, was called the pound. The pound which comes from the Roman, and the symbol it comes from the Roman libra. In the pound. But uh, the, because there was a, 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 originally it might have been one pound of silk, a pound sterling was one pound of silk, the weights of gold. But, but uh, the uh, standard exchange rate between the United States and Britain was um, between the dollar and the pound was uh, the pound was worth 4.86 times the amount of um, times the dollar 4.86 dollars because there's 4.86 times as much gold in the pound as there was in, in the dollar the back of the dollar well, these are the systems now just have a you don't need to this I'm not giving a history lesson of this but it is a good idea because to keep an eye out on these these trans this transition because it gives you one way of looking at history. And the history, uh, of course, you can look at it through politics, you can look at it through all kinds of different things, but this is a good way of doing it. Now, uh, what happened here is that in 1914, uh, World War I broke out. But in a more important event, well, not a more important event, but but a more important monetary event occurred one year earlier. In 1913, the United States created a central bank. It didn't have one before. Britain had had one since 1694. Bank of England was created in 1694, but America didn't have a central bank then. They got one in 1913, the Federal Reserve System. Why that became so important is that the United States economy at this time was bigger, not just bigger than the biggest, other big, next biggest economy, but it was bigger than the next three biggest economies put together. It was bigger than the pound sterling, than the pound, uh, uh, than, the, than the British economy, or the Ger plus the German economy, plus the French economy. So you have the same. Now, use the term currency areas, that was entitled, a currency area is a zone of fixed exchange rate. You can also think of of, uh, of a common currency area as, as a currency area. The Thai currency area representing the Thai economy, that's a, that's a currency area. Uh, but, um, but the uh, dollar area, counting the United States, of course, is a currency area, but then 
Uh, a lot of countries fix their currencies to the dollar. Panama has done that since 1904. The fixed exchange rate to the dollar. And Panama was created as a country in 1904. And uh, that Panama has had uh, for 103 years now a fixed exchange rate with the dollar. And it gets more or less American monetary policy. It's like a monetary province of the United States. Because it doesn't, uh, it, it has a fixed exchange rate. Uh, it's been a little different from a fixed exchange rate. Actually, they don't produce the paper currency. They use dollars as a paper currency. And they have a, their own currency called the Balboa, the Spanish, named after the Spanish discoverer, but that's a, a coin. Also, a few countries like uh, Ecuador is dollarized. Ecuador uses the dollar in, in the uh, in currency, the, the national currency. Was. And all of the Gulf states, most of the Gulf states in the Arabian Gulf, keep their currency fixed to the U.S. dollar. And China kept its currency fixed to the U.S. dollar from 1994, after a devaluation then, to, to two years ago, when it made a little <coughs> moves uh, to let it appreciate some of the stuff. So the dollar area is, a, is another currency area. And the European area is another currency area. The European area covers now not just the 13 countries in the EMU, but the, all the other countries that are tied to the EMU uh, with fixed exchange rates, what they call the exchange rate mechanism. Also, uh, 14 of countries in Africa are in the Eurozone. They've been, they kept fixed exchange rates among themselves and to the Eurozone uh, ever since 1945. They, well, 1945, they were in the former French countries, former French colonies of Africa. And then in 1945, they still called the CFA Frank area. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the CFA, uh, F used to mean Francaise, the France, that means uh, financier. So it doesn't have the French connotation. But they're all, those 14 countries are now tied to the uh, zone. Let's see, this is um, a picture, a picture of it, um, uh, of the world of currency areas. In, in, in today, let me see if I have my, if I got my uh, pointer looking at it. See now, <coughs> now I put down here at the bottom. This is the euro zone. This, this is the euro zone. This is the dollar area. The area represents uh, uh, the uh, GDP, more or less proportion to GDP of the United States. The GDP of the United States is $14 trillion. The GDP of the euro area is $11 trillion, current exchange rate. And the GDP of the yen area is 4.5 or $4.7 trillion. So those are the biggest uh, currency areas in the, uh, in the world. And then the uh, RMB area is the uh, next, because that is, that's now a $3 trillion economy. And that's the And then the pound sterling, which is independent, it didn't join the eurozone. Is um, uh, is a two and a half trillion dollars. So this is the biggest currency areas in the world. And there now this is what I here's the the CFA franc area. Is there 14 countries in the African zone? There are two big central banks in Africa, and they have about six and seven uh, countries in them each, and uh, they're um, uh, they're tied to the uh, euro. To the euro, absolutely, absolutely fixed rate. But just better start to think with this headline: is fixed exchange rate system out moment. If it were, you'd have to give up the, the euros. The Europeans would have to go back to their um, give up their euro and go back to their national currencies, which is a mess. Well, I mean, all of these countries would have to split off from this and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah. be careful what you wish for. You wish for that. Uh, so um, uh, now, uh, if we look at this, this uh, these are features of the gold standard in history. Now, I'm putting those features down. Not necessarily they're not necessarily all good things, but these are things that the gold standard did. Uh, maybe not necessarily always beneficial, but these were things that characteristics of the gold standard. 
But our problem is that when we got rid of the gold standard, uh, we got rid of it without replacing, finding something else to fulfill these things. It was an international gold standard. There's an automatic monetary policy. Just as the, um, all those central banks in Europe, all the central banks in the Euro Eurozone, the, the, the great, uh, the most famous central bank in the world, one of the third, second or third most famous central bank in the world, the Bundesbank, now has no monetary policy. You know, the Bank of France, Napoleon might turn over his grave, has no monetary policy, no independence. They're, they're like um, those big central banks have no important what's, whatsoever in policy. The only importance they have is that the heads of those, the governors of those central banks sit on the council of the European Central Bank. There's a certain European Central Bank makes monetary policy. But if you have, if you have uh, a, any fixed exchange rate system, it won't work unless you've got a budget balance or you have prudent fiscal policy. You have to have, it doesn't mean you can't have a deficit, but if you build up a lot of public debt, you have to pay it back afterwards if you're going to maintain confidence in it. A lot of Britain, Britain had all kinds of wars. Britain uh, had, uh, had uh, seven wars with France in the 18th century. Seven wars with France. Every time it ran big deficits to finance the war, and it won them all, by the way. But it, uh, the people said that, that uh, uh, the British Empire was built up uh, by, uh, you know, in a fit of absent-mindedness. By, by their, anyway, budget deficits. But then after the war, they'd have a sinking fund to pay back the debt. And they'd get back down again, all set to fight the next war. It's so on So, uh, prudent fiscal policy, low public debt, limited international borrowing. Uh, you couldn't have a country having too much international debt, because that would undermine the thing. And the low tax rates, of course, they were all low at that time. And uh, constraint on, uh, on constraint on global expansion, that's something. Uh, not many people think of, but under the gold standard, the gold standard is a gold depends on the amount of gold. And the expansion of the money supply in the world under a gold standard, a pure gold standard, is limited by discoveries of gold. Well, as the world population expands, uh, demand increases for, you need more money, but there's not, enough, there's not an expansion of gold that keeps up with population because the gold is limited in the um, earth surfaces. So the price of gold gets more expensive, which means that prices go down. Deflation. Gold goes up in value, commodity prices go down. That's what we mean by that. So there's a restraint on gold. It's like an environmental warning to us. If you were outrunning the gold supply, too much money going around expanding, population is expanding at a rapid rate, but it, you, the, the gold was a kind of warning, or gold at plus silver, be a kind of warning that there's a limit to growth. And this is the limit. But now we took off, got rid of gold, so abandoned that limit, and only now are people beginning to think that there are limits to growth. We're getting big potential catastrophes to worry about. Global warming, endangered species, the, the, um, the destruction of rainforests, and so on. Too much growth is creating, creating major problems. So the gold standard did this, but, and, but we got rid of that warning sign, and then we've gone along, but now we're, we're getting a warning sign that the world can't expand too rapidly. Population is now six and a half billion people in the world. And uh, just think of what would happen if, if in, 19, in 1800, the population of the world was one billion. Now it's 6.5 billion. What would it be at that same rate, if that same rate of population expansion continued into 20, uh, well, um, let's see what, to the year 3000, another thousand years. Trillions and trillions of people in the world. Of course, it would be a catastrophe. You couldn't, couldn't have, you can't have that pop population explosion. And it's going to be curved, and I'm sure, we, I think people think it's going to get up to 
a, a limit of uh, nine billion or something, and then maybe it'll uh, go down at, or stay stable at some point, nine billion. But, but uh, we don't. Um, uh, nobody. That's really guesswork because all kinds of factors can change. It. Well, um, the the United States then came along. Became the biggest economy in the world after 1880, and then you can read read what it said there. And then uh, it uh, became the American century. The dollar became after World War One. It, it replaced the pound sterling as the major currency in the world, and that's the world that we moved into. Then after Bretton Woods, after after 1944, uh, the uh, IMF and World Bank were created. That didn't create a new monetary system. <clears throat> that just uh, just ratified the monetary system that had come into place in 1944, from 1934, 1934, 1934 to 1971. The international monetary system is based on the dollar <coughs> and gold, with, do with gold priced at $35 an ounce, and that was what characterized the system. That system broke up in 1971 when President Nixon took the dollar off gold and the countries moved to flexible exchange rates. They moved for three months to flexible exchange rates, and nobody wanted them. They all hated them. So they went back to fixed exchange rates around the dollar. Before, in the Bretton Woods era, the dollar was convertible into gold, and the other currencies were fixed to the gold convertible dollar. But in, after 19, in this new system created in 1971, uh, the uh, Dollar, uh, dollar was no longer convertible to gold, so it was a pure dollar. Well, that broke up, and uh, then for two years, the international, two, 1972 to 74, they uh, got flexible exchange rates, moved to that, but nobody wanted them. Nobody wanted flexible exchange rates. And there was a, a committee, the Committee of 20 was working day in and day out to try to find a way to negotiate a return to a fixed exchange rate system. And it was uh, very uh, difficult to do that. Uh, they they couldn't, couldn't agree on it, largely because the other countries wanted a system, and maybe the United States did too, that would treat the dollar like any other currency. And yet the size of the dollar was so enormous you couldn't, you couldn't have it, you couldn't strap down the dollar. We're facing that system today. In the papers over the weekend, people talk about the falling dollar. And some people are saying, oh, we need to have intervention to stop the falling dollar. But how do you get in, in concerted intervention of the big powers? How do you get that? Well, you get that, but, but uh, uh, it's like, like, a, uh, like trying to stop a, a, a waterfall. It's like a, it's a, you, can't, you have to have buying up their excess dollars in the world and people start to dump dollars. Uh, the central banks can all go in and buy up those dollars and take those off the market. Thailand can go and buy up those dollars. But in the process, it creates bots, creates Thai currency. So you have too much bots. So indirectly, in buying up all those dollars would create great inflation too great inflation in the, in the country. So uh, the other thing to do is, well, let's let currencies appreciate. And then they, people in countries worry about competitiveness and everything else. It's a mess. The system we have is not, not a good system. It's not working well. It's a, we have to recognize that the, what we, the mistake was in not working harder and getting back to a, 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 an international monetary system again. People thought of, well, uh, at people who were advocating flexible exchange rates were saying, well, there were three, three things that they said about flexible exchange rates. They said it would solve all the problems. First of all, if uh, you have flexible exchange rates, um, uh, countries don't need reserves. Well, back then when they were saying that, total reserves were about $50 billion. And today, total reserves are five trillion dollars. An enormous expansion of reserves. You need vastly more reserves under flexible rates than you need it under fixed rates. And this is the one of the things. The other thing they said is 
you don't have uh, you want you don't have exchange control. Milton Friedman uh, basically didn't like uh, ex the exchange controls of Britain and the European countries in the post-war period. He said it's better for them to have flexible exchange rates than exchange control. But now people have exchange controls anyway. Almost every country has some kind of exchange control. Uh, so uh, uh, and then the third thing that that people said was that the advocates of flexible exchange rates, if you have flexible exchange rates, you would have any imbalances. <laughs> we have bigger imbalances in terms of trade deficits and surpluses than we ever had before. Enormous deficit, $900 million deficit of the United States. China's got a $200 billion surplus. Japan's got a $150 billion surplus. Germany doesn't have a currency, but it's got a $180 billion surplus. And Spain, which doesn't have a currency either, has an $80 billion deficit, $90 billion deficit. So um, you, you, all of those arguments for flexible rates were were, uh, were false. No, we had no predictions on it. Well, we uh, mentioned that the Britain Woods system broke down. Uh, President Nixon took the dollar off calls. Um, you asked, I could ask the question, gold standard, what killed it? Charles Reese, a very smart economist, said democracy killed the gold standard. And he meant by that that, uh, that the, um, in the, in the, he was the, the president of the Bank of France in, in the 1920s, and he wrote in books on He was a good economist. Um, uh, and he meant that uh, the demands of the population for uh, more governments to do more things for them, for welfare services, all these other things, are going to put demands on the part of governments that they can't afford. They're going to have deficits. They're going to run budget deficits. And then the deficits will have to be financed by the central banks, and then they'll have that will put the countries off the gold standard, just like war puts countries off the gold standard. That was one thing. Or you could say some people think that the, the Great Depression killed the gold standard. When Europe went back to the gold standard, because they didn't like in 1925, um, they went back to the gold standard in 1925. First Germany in 24, and Britain in 25, and France in 26. Um, and then the rest of the world went back to the gold standard because they didn't like the dollar standard back in the 1920s. <clears throat> they went back to the gold standard, but creating a tremendous increase in demand for gold that brought on the big deflation of the Great Depression, the 30% fall in prices that was the, the Great Deflation that ended the Great, great Depression. Well then, uh, I've, I've argued that my theory of this is that the United States uh, killed the gold standard. Basically, the United, not necessarily in any devious plan to do it, but by uh, just by its own policy. Eventually, the dollar took over and replaced gold. The we're in a dollar standard now, and gold is held in central banks. As I say, 900 million ounces of it, but it's not not being used for anything now. It's just a, just a commodity for the economy. Reserves something, uh, but the uh, <coughs> IMF in 1944 was set up to manage the dollar gold standard, a fixed exchange rate system. The I International Monetary System was set up to manage the fixed exchange rate system. When it, it broke down, it lost essentially that function. But then it, it put, we moved to flexible exchange rates. <coughs> But the, in the treaty, the new treaty said manage flexible exchange rate without any consideration of what that management would be. Now that today in some uh, big discussions, uh, for a while the United States was pressuring countries to change exchange rates on the, on the currency. China, they were pressuring China. They pressured Japan to change exchange rates. In the, uh, in the 1980s, which is the Plaza Accord. Um, <coughs> that was, began to be called Japan bashing by the United States. Now it's China bashing the United States. But the United States didn't like the idea of 
doing this bashing, so they shifted it to the IMF. So the IMF doing the bashing. Now what they, the way that was done is that in 1977, uh, the IMF had to decide what to do if they had any role with exchange rates. And they established this idea which is called multilateral surveillance. They look at all countries in the world and then they give advice on exchange rates in, in that period. Well, this year, uh, th these, these things didn't have much bite <coughs> and the United States uh, pushed for and got a revision of those guidelines on multilateral surveillance. And this occupied a big discussion in the um, uh, IMF this uh, spring and summer. And they brought out new guidelines for it that uh, would talk about a country that has big trade balance surfaces as they call that currency misaligned. And because people had been criticizing the IMF because they only pick on small countries, they decided to pick on the dollar first. And they came out and said, the dollar is misaligned. The dollar is overvalued. They said that in, in October. They said it once in, I think, July, and then they said it again in October, the managing director. The dollar is around the The real problem, you get into a real problem when you say uh, the IMF has what they call Article 4 consultation. And um, that's coming up in China. Which is due to come up this month, sometimes. maybe maybe next month. Probably China will postpone it for, the, for a little while. It take a lot of preparation and so on. But uh, but these are we're going to hear a lot about these things going on in the future. Because of what to do? If China has, of course, its own policy, uh, but um, China's got a, a surplus now of. 200 billion. But is exchange rate change the right mechanism? Japan had a surplus in the 1980s. In fact, from 1980 until the present, in every year, Japan has had a big surplus, usually over $100 billion, sometimes over $150 billion. Right now, the surplus of Japan is $150 billion. Was exchange rate the remedy for Japan? Under the exchange rate bashing, that was what the directive for Japan to appreciate their currency. Well, they did because in 1985, the G5 got together at the Plaza Accord to pressure, well, the U.S. was saying all countries, all the other countries have to appreciate the currency, but essentially it mainly applied to Japan. And um, the Japanese currency in the next 10 years tripled in value against the U.S. dollar. Time of the Plaza Accord, the dollar was 239, and this is September 22nd, say 19, 1985. Uh, the dollar was 239 yen. Ten years later, in April of uh, 1995, the dollar had dropped to a low point of 78 yen, from two four, more or less 240 to 280. See, it, it, the uh, dollar went to one third against the yen. The yen tripled in value against the other. Three hundred percent appreciation. Uh, what happened to trade balances? The balance today of Japan is bigger than it was then. And that's that's a colossal change in trade balances. What it did, it created a tremendous deflation in Japan. It created ten years of fifteen years of stagnation and and and, and deflation. I was in Japan in uh, March. And I read in the newspaper, it just happened to read in the newspaper, that uh, a historic point has been reached in Japan because for the first time since 1990, real estate prices had stopped falling. In other words, from 1990 to the present, that's 17 years, uh, real estate prices have been falling in Japan, all because of the hangover from that big appreciation of the, uh, of the currency. You know, uh, for a long time, uh, the historic post-war exchange rate between the dollar and the yen 
for 360 yen to the dollar. That was from 1948 until 1971. 360. And now the uh, yen, the dollar is, has been uh, now not at the low point of, uh, of 80 yen, 78 yen, but it's been around 115, 120. And this morning it's 109. So we have that tripling of the yen against the dollar over that period with deflation and everything else that goes in, into it. Well, um, three revolutions in the 1970s, the divorce of money from gold. Gold is no longer part of our international system. Managed flexible exchange rates, and then the Second Amendment to the uh, uh, IMF article. Uh, I, I make some criticisms of James of the, of the person mostly. This is a picture of the uh, dollar against the euro and the dollar against the yen. Against Actually, it's the exchange rate on 100 uh, yen. The blue line is 100 yen. Um, now, uh, let, let's just look at this. This is, because this is the world we're living in now. This is the world we have to live in now. The dollar against the yen. And it, it, the, the, dollar, uh, the dollar cycle. Up, down. Up, down, up. This is the euro. This is the euro one. So up means up for the euro means down for the dollar. Up in the nineteen up for the euro means down for the dollar. Falling dollar in the nineteen seventies. Rising dollar under the Reaganomics, supply side revolution, tax cuts and tight money to stop the inflation. And then the plaza accord up here to get the dollar uh, down and the euro up, and the euro stayed up. Then you have here, uh, around 1990, you have here uh, the, um, uh, the uh, high point here where the dollar reaches the high for the... This, now, this is, this is not the... You can think of this as the euro, but it's the ECU before the euro. The euro didn't come into existence until 1999. But this is the European currency unit before because the euro was based on the basket of the European currency. So this is the, and then, then you had, uh, then you had the, the uh, kind of European uh, crisis where the Deutsche Mark went way up. And then you had this movement way down and uh, where the uh, uh, euro goes way down. This is the great expansion of the 1990s of uh, the dollar, the dollar restoring. The Silicon Valley IT revolution came in. The U.S. growth rate was doubling in the last half of the 1990s. The dollar was soaring over this period. And that was the period of the Asian crisis, which everybody in this audience, uh, well, they wouldn't, you wouldn't remember it, but you might be too young to really remember, but you know from, from the history of the period. And the Asian crisis, no doubt about it, was caused by the instability of exchange rates. Not the stability, but the instability, although there is this element of stability there. The instability of the exchange rate, because uh, the, here it's now, now a question of the, this is the yen. This is the yen, uh, no, this is the price of the yen. Now, this, the yen is a high point up here. And then the yen falls over here. This is exactly the period, this fall in the value of the yen. From, from uh, 19, or from um, um, the dollar went from, say, 80 yen in 95 up to, to 148 yen in June 1998. So in those three years, this is the period when the, the most important currency, the blue line is the most important currency for Asia, the exchange rate of Asia. The dollar-yen exchange rate is the most important. And this was the period when the, the yen plummeted. The dollar soared to 148 yen. And what happens when the yen goes down like this, it dried up completely all Japanese investment to Southeast Asia. And Japanese investment had been in the FDI into Southeast Asia with the spark plug for the uh, South Asian growth of this period. And, the, and this uh, all dried up. And then the Asian currencies were tied more or less to the dollar, which was now soaring and appreciating. And they all had to get off the dollar. And that was the, was the thing. But the, all that investment, uh, Japanese plants in Thailand were, 
were just left with the, I don't know if they've come back now, Fujitsu, some of the big plants, I don't know if they've come back and so on, but, but what the, the typical thing that the Japanese plants did, they left Southeast Asia, and then they came back to China. They moved into China at that point. They decided that China is the market that they, they need to be in more. And that, this was the thinking. So it was the instability of the major currencies that created the, the Asian crisis. That was the, the external cause of it. And then, of course, the, the Asian countries didn't have a very smooth way of getting off their overvalued currencies because they had to act, they, to the extent they were fixed, they had to appreciate with the, with the US dollar. Over that period. The dollar was too strong. Every country that was, China was fixed to the dollar too. But China, China was okay because in 1994, China had devalued against the dollar. China had, the dollar in, 19, in, in, uh, in 1993 uh, was 5.5 RMB. And in January 1, 1994, China had this whopping devaluation to put the dollar up to initially 8.7 and then 8.3 against the dollar. And it stayed that way. So that 60% or 40% appreciation of the dollar depreciation of the yen protected China so it could weather the Asian crisis quite handily. And, and uh, although people thought that uh, because all the Asian currencies were going down, China would have to depreciate too, but the Prime Minister Hu Rongi came out and said there will be no change in the Chinese exchange rate for the foreseeable future. And everybody believed it. And when they did, Japanese investment, meanwhile, expecting before had been possibly expecting the risk of a devaluation, stayed out of China too. But as soon as he said that, all the Japanese investment came into China, and the black, the unofficial exchange rate came back down to normal, and it was. Uh, and China was a great shape, and that set China off onto this, uh, the great, you know, glorious path it was. And it kept that exchange rate too thick and thin. But in the, when the dollar was, was strengthening very strong during the Asian crisis and after, 1988, 1999, China and every single country that was fixed to the dollar had some deflation. Prices were going down. That was in, you ask, why did suddenly, uh, what, what did China have in common with Kuwait and the Emirates and Qatar and Saudi Arabia and Panama? Yet they were all fixed to the dollar and they all had deflation over that period. A little bit. You know, we're talking minus 1%, less than 1% of the inflation. Just a tiny, tiny little bit of, in Hong Kong, of course, too. Hong Kong had a bigger, bigger problem because of. Uh, because of the, uh, the turnover to, to China. So this is the, anyway. So we learn a lot from these uh, exchange rates. Um, but um, we want to get to, uh, I, I want to do, should the world have a million currencies? So why not? Let's see. How do you decide how many currencies there should be? Somebody asked me what I thought the optimum number of currencies. In a, in a flippant note, I said, um, well, it should be like, uh, like like God. It should be an odd number, perfectly less than three. But um, how many should, well, from a transaction standpoint, it would be great if every country could use the same currency or could relate their currency to, uh, to a, a common currency. And then from you have a single market in, in prices. This is just as an example, I took of this, this world, this, this uh, uh, classroom, this auditorium, being the world, and uh, people transacting. If you had 10 products to exchange uh, uh, with one currency, you have 10 prices. But if you have uh, 10 currencies, you've got 1,000 prices. It goes up to the square of the, of, the, uh, of the number of currencies. So it's very inefficient. So that's the cost of additional currencies. What is the optimum number of currencies? From the standpoint of communication, a single language would be the most efficient. 
know, before the Tower of Babel, the mythical Tower of Babel, a single language is the best. If everybody spoke the same language, they couldn't communicate better. And you don't need, whenever you have different languages, you need specialists or translators and interpreters and things of that nature, and that's uh, always needed. Well, of course, languages are different, and some languages are good, better than others, and et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, but from the standpoint of communication, the single language, in exactly the same way, language is a medium of expression, uh, and uh, curtsies are a medium of exchange. They're both mediums. They both serve units of account. Unit of account. Keynes once said, he began his book, the great book, The Treatise on Money, not the general theory, but he began his two volume work on money, Treatise on Money. The unit of account property of money is the most important property of money. And uh, so that was uh, anyway. unit of account property. How many units are needed? And then that depends on that. That's the quotation from John Stuart Mill that I said about the case for a world money has been made many times in history. In the ancient world, the talent was a common medium of exchange. And uh, um, if you, you can see the talent, what was the talent? The talent was a weight, but it was also a value. And the talent as a weight was a common weight to use throughout much of the world. It was the weight that uh, uh, a man, usually maybe a slave, could carry. So if we, uh, you ask what's the weight, how much is the talent today, he will say 50 pounds. 50 pounds is what they say. You see the talent, nobody calls it that, in airlines today. If you, there's a rule for many airlines, have common lines, there's no bag, no, none of your bags can be more than 70 pounds, I think it is. There's a, a rule when you send um, books or something by postal thing, no bag can weigh more than 70 pounds. I would get into trouble because my bags, when I travel, always are more than that. But, um, so it uh, creates a little problem. But, but that's the, and then that, the money started. What was, what was the talent of money? Talent became a money. Well, a talent uh, of, of money became the amount of gold that would be the equivalent of uh, about a, a, a pound weight in terms of uh, like copper or something like that. So a, a pound, um, uh, uh, a talent in money was something like 130 grains. And this is like 15 grains to, an, to a gram. So you can see that this is a very tiny amount. But what, what people did, when they didn't understand this, they would calculate the amount of some, something in the ancient world would say, so many talents of gold. And it was a huge number. More gold than what it would be in existence. But it wasn't that amount. The weight was no, never 70 pounds or 60 pounds of uh, gold. It was the, that, the 60 pounds of, say, copper that would have the equivalent of that in, in gold, which is what gold is the money is not well. Um, the, there was an Italian book that uh, in the 16th century advocated uh, a, a, a global money, actually for Europe, common money for Europe, called Two Lights, people know. And then there were congresses in the 19th century advocating a world currency, advocating a common unit of a common coin that could be used all over the world. And the basic, most popular idea was to take uh, 25 francs, or one pound, which is about the same, and five dollars, and adjust them so they're all the same. But Britain said no to it. Britain said, the French and the Americans wanted this, but Britain said no, because the pound was the closest thing to a global money. And when the pound was the, already the most widely used global money, then the, the British didn't want to have rivals for it. In exactly the same way, the United States, maybe the, maybe the United States, and in the future period, 
maybe Europe to be the two most strongest opponents of, uh, of global money. Well, it's, uh, it, this is a preference of superpowers, unilateralism and so on. Let me go on a little bit. Monetary independence and possibly a reserve currency. Let's see. Power configuration of nations. There is the world in 1913. The United States, the dollar, the U.S. area, GDP is bigger than the British Empire area, bigger than the other countries. Uh, but Britain is the center of the monetary system. Then, then we go to then the gold standard when it was reformed in 1928. There's no doubt that the United States was the center of that gold standard because the United States had stayed on gold all through the all through the war period. The other countries had gone off. It. The British Empire is losing significance. The pound has gone down. But this is the power configuration. Then, then the rise of the U.S. as superpower. This is the um, the configuration as you look at uh, before the euro. And you see the, uh, the European countries here. Germany, the, the white area, has, has uh, no... Uh, it's the third largest currency area in the world, but it's not, uh, not a, a really big one. But if you, when the euro created, this becomes now uh, another 110-pound gorilla. That is a big thing. Then the rise of China. Uh, if you, uh, China grows, it'll expand and become more important than, than, uh, than Japan and, and at some point. And then the possibility people talk about is an Asian currency area, which would combine the major countries with, with or without two different models, whether you, that would include India or not. India hasn't shown much interest in kind of East Asian uh, currency standard, but it might in the, in the future. But an Asian currency area would be a possibility, theoretically, but it's politically unlikely because it's very unlikely that you could get Japan and Germany, uh, uh, Japan and China into the same common currency framework. Uh, there's no way I could see that, uh, that, that uh, Japan and China could be part of a single currency area. They wouldn't give up their currency because you you can't have you couldn't have had the euro until you had this complete rapprochement between Germany and France, the old historic enemies for 200 years. They've been uh, big enemies, and you'd have to have that something equivalent to that in Asia for that to exist. But what you could have, of course, is uh, a kind of uh, area that would be linked to the dollar. If the dollar were part of it then the dollar could still be the anchor for that uh, currency, common currency area. And that, that would be a possibility in the APEC meeting. I made that suggestion at the Shanghai APEC meeting, uh, but, uh, but it's uh, not, uh, of course, if you, this would leave Europe up. But Europe now, there's even a possibility that Europe and the United States might stabilize the dollar euro rate. This would be a wonderful thing for the world economy if the dollar euro rate was stable. A little bit like in the 19th century, stabilizing gold price and the gold and silver. If you unite two blocks, uh, two of the biggest blocks, then that would be a big step. Or go beyond it, add Asia, and then great case could be made for a global currency. But I've made that. I've did that, made my first case for that to the uh, U.S. Congress in uh, uh, 1968, 1968, 40, 40 years ago. This is before the, before the international monetary system broke up. It would have been a lot easier then than it is now. Um, and uh, the end of major currency gyrations, a big advantage for it, would be an anchor for national currency. Suppose a country today, Suppose Thailand today, it wants a fixed exchange rate. For, forget what the paper says, which is not the fixed currency system. Forget what that is. Let's suppose you want. Many countries have fixed exchange rates. And the way you do it is you fix the exchange rate and let that currency use that anchor for your monetary policy. And then instead of, let's say, Thailand has a uh, uh, the Thai output is say 1% of the world economy. 1% of the world economy. 
The dollar, let's suppose to make the dollar area is stable. You don't have to worry about inflation in the United States. It's two and a half percent in the United States. You don't have to worry about inflation. Now, let's suppose you don't. Then, if you fix that dollar area, you're going to get the inflation rate in the long run of the United States. So that's the basic argument for it. But if you do it, you give up independent monetary policy. You have no independence in monetary policy. You just do what Hong Kong does. And what Hong Kong has done since 1983, despite it, it doesn't even have a central bank to do it. Commercial banks do intervening. They keep the dollar in tricks in terms of the Hong Kong dollar. And there's no independent monetary policy. And because there's no independent monetary policy, there are no politicians that can get to interfere with the adjustment mechanism. And, 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 uh, and Hong Kong accepts whatever, whatever the outcome is in terms of the inflation rate. But it's always about a little bit higher or a little lower than the inflation rate of the United States. Because the United States has been stable, the most stable currency in the 200 years, in the last 200 years, then this is, is uh, not a bad deal. So it's the word anchor. Now, now that's the dollar. But now I, I just put that chart on uh, the board of the exchange rates, which shows that the dollar goes through these cycles. And every time it goes through the cycle, uh, the countries that are fixed to the dollar have a little bit of difficulty. If the dollar goes up and it becomes strong as in the late 1990s, Countries may have a little less inflation or more deflation than they want. As the country, the dollar goes down, they get a little bit more inflation. China right now, even though it's just appreciating by 5% against the US dollar, has a little bit more inflation. Even under fixed rates, when, when China had its fixed rate from 94 to, or let's say from 97 to, 19, um, to 2005, when the dollar went up in the late 90s, it had a little deflation. When the dollar went down in 2003 and 4, the inflation rate went up to over 4% four, four one year, a little higher than China wanted. But that's not, not too bad. However, if we could get, instead of the dollar, another anchor for countries like Thailand, another anchor, let's suppose that the Asian currency system is, solution is not going to work, if you could get another anchor, if it was the dollar plus the euro plus the yen and maybe plus the Chinese RMB, even though the RMB is inconvertible, it's not a convertible currency, so that's an argument against the RMB, but it's because the RMB is expected to rise, it, uh, it, you could probably use it still. So you could take those four currencies, you could even add the pound sterling if you wanted, and take a basket of those and make that the global anchor and build a global monetary system on that basis. After all, in the 19th century they had gold. We don't need to use gold anymore. We do have enough intelligence to create, create a, our own. And as long as that system would work, uh, as long as there was no big global war. Of course, if there's a big war, all bets are off. Forbid that we have one, but no system, no no monetary system has ever been in history or ever will be warproof if the the nations involved in this getting into war. I think that uh, it's an optimistic view, but you should go with that uh, view, and and that would be a way to to do it. There's different uh, approaches to it, different stages of reform. You could have a basket with the modifying the eye. Every country would have a share in it. I call it the, the global currency of the intern. The world map would be something like that. And then uh, every country would be inside that. And that would be Thank you. If the audience can uh, have some questions, do you have time? Yeah. Okay. Robert, I, am, I admire you for your courage of advocating something very futuristic and idealistic. And I do see that you try to argue against every possible alternative that people can put against what you say. But basically, uh, the issue is more than 
the ideal one world currency regime that you're looking for. The issue of transitional period, which is going to be a long transition, and therefore countries, particularly like Thailand, which is small, would we be just simply just a little offshoot of say, if US is our anchor, then we would be country with no self-determination at all. Mm -hmm. We'll be moving along with the whims of the prudence mm -hmm. of politician in US yeah. or central banker, hopefully wise yeah. central banker over there. So that's the issue. The issue is self-determination in a less than ideal world in a world where you cannot trust whether there will be wisdom that come from US and normalization that is happening around the world have experienced some of those difficulties that they could not move themselves out from their local difficult difficulties during that period when US is moving up and up and US does experience some volatility it's not that stable as as uh, we hope it to be. And therefore, I think the issue of transitional self-determination and not allowing discretionary policy that come from someone, someone elsewhere would be a major issue. Your language analogy and metaphor is a good one. Obviously, the language you move to one language will be very efficient in communication around the world.